as we usually do, we're going to do start with some meditation together. Then we'll have a, a bit of a Dhamma talk and we'll have some Q&A uh, towards the last part of the session. Uh, and then we will uh, see how it all goes. Uh, so uh, I reckon we might as well start with the meditation straight away, not waste any time, uh, maximize the spiritual practice, uh, and then minimize the theoretical aspects, which then come later on. So we get the uh, get our priorities right, as they say. Yeah. So uh, let's start. So uh, find yourself a nice, comfortable posture. And uh, as always, close your eyes and close the eyes just to take away that massive disturbance, uh, which is the seeing of the world. Uh, and just closing the eyes is often enough just to already feel more peaceful and more uh, settled within. Uh, so close the eyes and then feel the body. Uh, feel that the body is okay, uh, that you are at ease, that you don't have any unnecessary pains, uh, that you sit in a posture that you can maintain for about 30 minutes or so. That is kind of the idea here. So to start off by finding that ease uh, where you're sitting. So you can find that uh, feeling of just uh, enjoying the sitting itself. And just gradually allow yourself to relax, uh, relaxing physically, but also mentally. Uh, so the mind is at ease and the body is at ease. Uh, and uh, to do this, just make sure that you have some kindness towards yourself. Uh, remember that we're all trapped in this existence as human beings. Uh, and that trap, we deserve compassion because of that. So we have to be compassionate to ourselves. Uh, this idea of self-compassion is very useful uh, on the spiritual path, uh, where you kind of look after yourself and you care for yourself. Uh, and even if the rest of the world does their own thing, uh, at least you look after yourself. Uh, and so you allow yourself to relax. Uh, be gentle with yourself. Uh, be kind. Uh, you don't have to be anyone in particular during this short time uh, just meditating. Uh, all you can do is just... Uh, Go into your own private world uh, and just be at ease. Uh.
And uh, as you relax in this way, uh, you gradually let go of the world outside. Uh, and the way to do that is to always remember where real happiness, real contentment is to be found, uh, where the future is built up. The future is built up by practicing the spiritual path uh, and not by taking an interest in the world. Uh, the world is always a distraction. Uh, the world doesn't really take you anywhere. Uh, the world is more going round and round and round uh, without purpose, uh, without end. Uh, it is the spiritual path that is truly interesting. Uh, it is a spiritual path that has a real purpose and real goal. Uh, so let go of the world. Uh, let go of all those uh, silly concerns in the world around you uh, and come back to the simplicity and the mindfulness of the spiritual path. Uh. And uh, as you gradually leave the world behind, uh, as you let go of all the troubles and the conflicts and the issues in the world, uh, and at the same time, incline your mind towards the spiritual practice, uh, understanding that the, what a wonderful and remarkable thing it is uh, to have teachings like the Buddha's teachings in the world, uh, and that we have these teachings available to us. Uh, what an amazing thing that is. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is that there is such hope and such beauty in the world. Uh, something we all can aspire to uh, and draw some benefit straight away uh, if you practice these teachings in the right way. Uh, so find some inspiration in the Dhamma, uh, understanding the beauty, the value uh, of this remarkable jewel uh, that we call the Buddha's teachings. Uh,
And uh, as you slowly abandon the world uh, and you find some inspiration in the Dhamma, in the spiritual life, uh, you can probably find that your mindfulness becomes a bit sharper. Uh, and as your mindfulness becomes sharper, uh, you will start to see the breath. Uh, and when you start to see the breath, you're already doing the mindfulness of breathing. Uh, so just carry on very gently with that mindfulness of breathing. Uh, make sure that the breath is uh, uh, delightful, uh, that you don't hold on to the breath, uh, that you view the breath as if it is a mountain in the distance, uh, not something you are controlling, uh, but something that you are enjoying to be with. Uh, the breath leads a life of its own. Uh, the breath does its own thing. Uh, and all you have to do is to observe it. Uh, as if from a distance.
be very careful when you do the breath meditation not to interfere. Yeah. If you interfere, it starts to become uncomfortable very quickly. Yeah. Remember that the breath is its own phenomenon. Yeah. It's its own thing. Yeah. It has nothing to do with you. Yeah. If you think of the breath as your breath, uh, you will control it. Uh, but if you think of the breath as just another phenomenon in the world, uh, then you can let it be. Uh, so keep that distance from the breath. Uh, just something delightful, something peaceful, uh, something smooth and silky that touches you, uh, but not something that is yours. Uh.
Okay, so coming close to the end, uh, and uh, before we come to the very end, uh, once again, just briefly review your meditation here today, uh, and ask yourself specifically what it is that makes the meditation peaceful, uh, what does it mean to let go, uh, and how is it that you direct your perceptions in the right way. Uh, Okay, okay, everyone. So um, that is the meditation, and uh, always a good way to start uh, the um, uh, the talk, if you like, or start the uh, session. Always do some nice meditation together, uh, and it kind of clears out some of the I don't know the junk. Is that is that an <laughs> acceptable word? Some of the junk from the mind. Uh, I'm sure you know what I mean. Uh, sometimes, if you're other people saw all the weird things that we think it would, might be even slightly embarrassing. I just know from my own mind that I'm not very keen on having everyone knowing exactly what I think. Yeah, I think I might be uh, might be kind of a bit scary. Huh? But on the other hand, the reality probably is that we all think things that are a bit uh, you know useless, huh? and so maybe it is not so embarrassing after all. I don't know. Huh? Anyway, I want to talk today a little bit about, we have been recently, we have been looking at the Metta Sutta here in the monastery. And we have been looking at all the various aspects of this beautiful Sutta of the Buddha. And it's a very interesting Sutta in a number of ways, because it, even though it deals with Metta, the idea of loving kindness or friendliness or whatever you want to call it, even though that is what it deals with, it has so much more in that sutta. I don't know if you recite it in English sometimes, and if you do recite it in English, you very often find that it you know, starts off with all the different aspects of virtue, with living simply, with being contented, and all of these kind of things. There's so much in that sutta. And you wonder, is it all about metta, or is it much more? What is it really about, this particular sutta? And I want to focus on a, particular, a few of those uh, ideas that are found in the sutta uh, to, uh, as, a, as a foundation for the talk. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that you find is that uh, all of these things that you find at the beginning of the Metta Sutta, well, they are really about virtue. They are about kindness. They are about sila on the Buddhist path. Yeah, How to treat other people well, how to treat yourself well, uh, how to speak in the right way. Uh. And so all of these things, they are then the foundation for metta practice. Uh, you have, first of all, virtue, then the metta. And uh, so one way of thinking about the metta sutta is in terms of virtue, uh, samadhi, or if you like, meditation, uh, and then wisdom at the end. Yeah, virtue, meditation, and then wisdom. And this, of course, is the standard way of thinking about the Buddhist path. Uh, this is what the Noble Eightfold Path is about. Uh, yeah, this is the structure of almost all practice in Buddhism. Uh, and so you find that structure right there in the Metta Sutta, virtue, meditation, and then wisdom as a consequence of that. Uh, and of course, virtue is a very important part also of Metta itself, because if you have if you're going to be friendly towards other people, you have to be kind to them. Uh, yeah, you, can, you cannot have a, um, you cannot have a metta without virtue. They have to go together. It's through the kindness that we manifest the metta at the very beginning of the path. Uh, how we treat others through speech and actions. Uh, so it's a very natural part of it. Uh, and then, as we practice this metta, we take it very deeply. We take it also 
into our minds and we start to think in the right way, then it starts to issue into meditation practice. You become peaceful. The mindfulness starts to arise. And through that, we achieve samadhi, which then allows us ultimately to see things according to reality, which is the very end of the path itself. But one of the interesting little things that you find as part of the virtue on in the Metta Sutta is the idea of not deceiving anyone. Yeah, the Pali word is vikubbati, uh, vikubeta, uh, I think. No, nik, nikubeta, that's right, nikubeta, not to deceive anyone. Yeah, this is kind of part of this idea of the um, virtue that leads up to the Metta practice. Uh, and uh, deceive, deception is not something that maybe we talk about all that often in Buddhism. But actually, when you read the suttas, it is something that you find in the suttas in a few specific places. Uh, and so it is actually, it actually matters. Uh, it is not an inconsequential thing at all as part of the practice is concerned. Uh, so I thought I was going to talk a little bit today about the idea of deception uh, and the various kinds of deception that often happens uh, in our lives and how we can deceive others and deceive ourselves and all of these kinds of things uh, and how that then this becomes a blockage for the practice of metta in particular, but also for the entire Noble Eightfold Path more generally. Uh, and uh, you can imagine that if you are a deceptive character, uh, if you are, if you deceive other people, or even if you just deceive yourself, uh, that act of deception uh, is actually a very long way away from the idea of friendliness, of love, or compassion, or understanding. Uh, in many ways, it is the opposite of that. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is because why we want to deceive someone uh, is because we are trying to often to hide something. Uh, there's something we don't want the other person to know, or we're trying to distort their idea of reality, to delude them somehow. Uh, and, uh, to, uh, uh, and what that means very often, if you try to distort the ideas of other people, uh, it means that there is a lack of self-acceptance very often in this. Uh, I don't accept myself as I, as I am, and for that reason I try to distort how other people view me or how they think about me and all of these kind of things. And so we're not really at ease with ourselves. This is one of the reasons why we often end up with this sort of deception or distortion of who we actually are as human beings. And so very often the idea of deception is the opposite of self-acceptance. And when you have self-acceptance, then of course that is when you can start to have a good relationship with yourself. If you don't even have a good relationship with yourself. If you're not able to have that integrity of being outwardly who you also are inwardly, if you try to deceive the world as to who you actually are, and this is very, very common in the world, uh, yeah, then of course, how can you have any kind of compassion or love or friendliness for anyone in the world uh, if you don't have that degree of self-acceptance? Uh, and so the idea of metta in, requires the idea that we don't deceive anyone, uh, anyone else, or indeed ourselves, uh, because self-acceptance is such an important part uh, of, of what this uh, really is about. Uh. But uh, so this, this is how it fits in with the idea of metta, yeah? the idea of accepting oneself, of being who we actually are. Uh. But um, uh, there is uh, another way that the idea of uh, uh, not of uh, distorting or not being honest, if you like, or deceiving the world is talked about in the suttas. Uh, and that is a set of five factors known as the five factors of striving or the five factors of making right effort. Uh, very important part of the Buddhist path is the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, right effort, sammapadana or sammavayama. And so to be able to have that right effort, we have to put in place these other five things. These are the five factors that allow us to have right effort. If these other five things fall into place, then right effort tends to happen as a consequence. So this is found in the suttas as a particular set of factors called the five factors of striving or the five factors of effort. So what are these five? Yeah, And these are, I don't know if you have heard about these five before, because they're not, I have never heard 
them talked about before. So maybe this is one of the first talks about the five factors of effort. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? So listen, yeah, this is exciting. Maybe you never heard this before, eh? because this is rare to hear about from the suitors. So the five factors of right effort. I can't remember ever hearing anyone talking about this, but I came across it this, just the other day, more or less by accident. Eh? And so the first factor of right effort eh, is the idea of having faith. You yeah? have faith in the Buddha, or if you like, confidence in the Buddha. Some people like the word confidence, some people like the word faith. So go with what feels acceptable to you, uh, yeah? and, and uh, whatever, whatever works for you. Both words are translations, acceptable translations of the Pali word sadha, which is at the root of this. Uh, and so the idea here is that you have faith in the Buddha. This is specifically what is said in this particular context. And why is that important? Why does that give rise to right effort? And of course, the idea is if you have faith in the Buddha, it is not just the Buddha that you have faith in, but you have faith in all of those things that come downstream from the Buddha. Because if there is a Buddha in the world, then there is a Dhamma, then there is a teaching, a teaching about liberation. If there is a teaching about liberation, then there are people who acquire those qualities that are a result of that teaching. And when there is all of these things, well, then, of course, there is also a path, because a path also is part of this idea of the Dhamma. You put the Dhamma into practice, and the path emerges as a consequence of that. So everything on the spiritual path emerges out of confidence in the Buddha. And the confidence in the Buddha is really just a confidence in the possibility of awakening in this world. The possibility that there is something more. The possibility that there are some very beautiful, profound states of mind that are attainable by everyone in this world. The Buddha is the first one to do this. He shows us the way, and then we also have that opportunity afterwards. So by reflecting on the qualities of the Buddha, someone who has perfect peace, someone who has perfect mindfulness, someone who has compassion for the whole world, someone who has an insight into reality, all of these beautiful aspects of the Buddha, you are at that moment also inclining your own mind in that direction. At that moment, you know, yeah, or you have a feeling, or you have an intuition, or whatever you want to call it, that these things are real possibilities. Also, because you may have seen examples of this in your own life, people who are leaning in that direction. And that is a very powerful thing, because if you feel the qualities of the Buddha within you, what the Dhamma is pointing towards, when you feel that, your defilements disappear. The defilements are no longer in your mind because your mind is leaning towards all of these good qualities instead. So the whole purpose of contemplating the Buddha is actually to get rid of the defilements of the mind that block the meditation, block your willingness to put forth the right kind of effort to have success on the path. Yeah, Even just the effort to be kind, even just the effort to meditate a little bit every day, the effort to listen to a Dhamma talk, the effort to read the suttas, or whatever it is, all of that is blocked by the defilements of the mind. And in this way, you're unblocking those defilements simply by reminding yourself of what the spiritual path is about. So that Simple confidence in the teachings, the simple confidence that there are some very beautiful qualities to be achieved in this world, high states of mind. And I'm sure some of you have already had some of those experiences in your life where the mind suddenly reaches a different level, a different reality than what you're used to. And when that happens, it's like, wow, there's an eye opener. It's an understanding that the world is much more than we thought. And how wonderful that is. Because if the world is just the ordinary humdrum things of ordinary life, that would be kind of terrible, wouldn't it? It is such an important thing that actually there is more than that in our lives. There's something extra that really makes life worth living in a much higher way. And so this is the idea of the confidence in the Buddha. And when you have that, the willingness, the desire to make the right kind of effort to uh, develop your mind, to change who you are as a person, it happens more or less automatically. Yeah. So this is the first of the five. Yeah. The second of the five is to have, this, this might surprise you, but the second one of the five is to have a good digestion. 
<laughs> I don't know if you have a good digestion. Hopefully you do, because it's a hassle not to have a good digestion. <laughs> but uh, this is what it says in the sutta as it talks about having a digestion that is not too cold and not too hot. So what does that mean? It means that your digestion is good. It does, you know, you don't have kind of all kind of problems, tummy problems, and all of these kind of things. But your digestion is quite nice, and this is very important in monastic life because in monastic life, very often you eat maybe one meal a day or two meals a day. You don't eat anything in the afternoon, and then it may be quite difficult, yeah, if you have a bad digestion. So a good digestion actually is very important. So how do we can we think about this? And the way that I think about this uh, is a reminder of how uncertain things can be in life. Uh, I see many monastics that enter monastic life and they have really good digestion when they start out. Uh, and then they may go to a different culture and eat all kinds of strange food. And after a few years, the digestion is completely shot and they can't, you know, and they, they have lots of problems because of that. Uh, and to me, it's a reminder of impermanence in general, uh, unreliability of our bodies, uh, unreliability of the world around us. Uh, and that impermanence, that unreliability is an incredibly, can be an incredibly big blockage to the spiritual practice. Uh, yeah, when suddenly the war, look at the wars that are happening around the world, we don't know what's going to happen around the corner. It is so uncertain, whether it's our bodies, in our families, in the world at large. Suddenly, the conditions for spiritual practice are far worse. Yeah, suddenly it becomes impossible. And the suttas actually talk about this. They talk about times of war, times of famine, times of all kind of upheavals in society. These are not the times for spiritual practice. Why? Because the society is in turmoil. No one has time to look after the mind, develop the mind. And so remember this. Yeah, remember the uncertainty of things in the world. And now is the opportunity. Never waste the chance to be kind. Now is the opportunity to be kind. Now is the opportunity to have compassion for the world. Now is the opportunity to do a little bit of meditation practice. Who knows what is going to come tomorrow? And this, to me, is the uh, the takeaway from this idea of having a good digestion is the reminder of the uncertainties in the world. Tomorrow your digestion might be bad and it's going to make it miserable if you try to meditate at that time. Tomorrow anything else can go wrong. Someone in your family might die. And if someone in your family dies, you may grieve and it may become incredibly sad. And that is going to be really, really detrimental and make it difficult in your spiritual life. So don't take things for granted. This is really what this is about. So um, then we have the third factor of these factors for striving. And the third factor, and this is the one which I thought was particularly interesting and is really what I wanted to talk about today. And this factor is called in Pali, it is called asatta and amayavi. And asatta means not to be uh, deceptive, and amayavi literally means not to be uh, tr tricky, not to be. Um, a trickster. Yeah, Maya in Pali often means like magic. And so magicians, they are called Mayavis. But in this context, it doesn't mean that we are magicians. It just means that we are tricksters. Yeah, we are kind of not really showing ourselves to the to the world, to the way that we actually are inside. We have a kind of superficial way of being, and then our inner life is often quite different. And this is uh, very, very common in the world, yeah, that one way is how we are on the surface, and we may look very happy on the surface, but when we are honest about ourselves, actually, we're not all that happy after all, yeah, we are very kind of funny and uh, and good in company, and we are kind of very good at having, at, um, you know, dealing with social situations, actually a lot of people are not, maybe not so many here, because we all meditate, maybe we kind of recoil a bit from that, but some people are like that, yeah, and I know lots of people like that, who are very outwardly very successful, outwardly very funny and very nice, but inwardly miserable. Yeah, there's a very disconnect between what they actually are and between how they kind of portray themselves to the world. 
And I would say that it is a great benefit to have more integrity in our lives, uh, not to always put on the face, uh, not to pretend that we're always happy when in fact we're not necessarily happy. It is okay not to be happy all the time. It is okay to suffer. The Buddha says there is suffering in life, so why not accept that? Uh, and when we live with greater integrity in our inner life and in our outer life are more aligned with each other, actually, it takes away a lot of tension in life. It's very tiring to always kind of uh, live up to some kind of external standard that is, uh, uh, that is kind of foisted upon us by society at large or by the expectations of the world around us. It is very painful. Uh, and having more integrity, having more self-acceptance and showing your real self to the world, uh, actually, I think that can be very useful, uh, not to be fake, uh, but to actually be realistic about what life is like. Uh. And when we are like that, when we are more realistic and we are more real and we live with greater integrity, it also allows other people to also live with greater integrity. Uh. Because if we live kind of fake lives, then other people feel they too have to live fake lives, right? Because they have to keep up with the Joneses, as they say. Yeah, and keeping up with the Joneses is stupid. We don't want to keep up with the Joneses. We want to keep up with the Buddhas. The Buddhas are much more important than the Joneses. So forget about the Joneses. We want to go for the Buddhas instead. So keep up with the Buddhas. And keeping up with the Buddhas means to be more honest about who you are. Yeah, and just having greater integrity in your life. And when you have that integrity, and when you show yourself for who you are, it is also easier for your teachers to support you. Because if you are honest and you say, yeah, I'm having these problems in meditation, it is, I have this kind of issues, yeah, and, uh, uh, or yesterday I had a good meditation, or whatever it might be, yeah then it is possible to help you. It is possible to give you some advice. Then when you go to the Buddha's teachings, you will see, oh yeah, these teachings apply to me. And then there is some hope for making progress on that basis because you have that integrity within you. You're not deceiving the world. But um, so that is about having integrity in one's life. But an even more problematic kind of deception that I was uh, mentioning very briefly at the beginning, uh, that is the self-deception that we sometimes have, uh, where we're not really honest with ourselves uh, as to what our problems are. Uh. And one of the really difficult things on the spiritual path is to have that degree of self-honesty. Uh. If we are too proud to really be honest about who we are, if our ego is too fragile to be able to deal with the problems in our life and accept that we are not perfect, yeah, the ego is a terrible thing. The ego gets in the way of all kinds of things. The ego doesn't want to see you as you actually are because that kind of destroys your self-image. As you lie to yourself, you don't tell you the, the truth about what are your real problems. Please don't do that, because if you do that, you're putting in place a major, major obstacle on the Buddhist path. To be able to evolve, to be able to deal with the issues that are actually there, you have to have that degree of self-honesty. And sometimes it is brutal. Yeah, Sometimes it is really hard to have that self-honesty. And sometimes your ego will not be very happy with it. But if you do dare to have that self-honesty, that is where you make progress. And the Buddha goes so far as to say that these are like treasures in life. If someone points out a problem in your life, and even though your ego kind of resists it, if you are willing to look at what your life really is like, it is like a treasure because it opens up a possibility of making progress on the path because you start to see the problems that are actually there. So be honest with yourself. Not too honest, not honest at the wrong time, because sometimes the ego is too fragile to be able to deal with it, but honesty at the right time. And when you're honest at the right time, then things will start to unfold in the right way as a consequence. So this is the kind of the honesty towards ourselves, understanding ourselves. And of course, this fits in with the idea of metta as well. It fits in with the idea of compassion for ourselves. It fits in with all of these ideas. Because if you have 
a degree of meta and self-acceptance. It means it's easier to also be honest about yourself and then see what is actually going on. And then there's some kind of hope of coming out of these, uh, uh, these kind of deception, little deceptions that we have in our life. Uh, so um, deception is uh, fundamentally problematic uh, on the path in so many different places. Uh, one of the very important things that we are trying on the Buddhist path uh, is to discover the truth. And of course, deception is the exact opposite of truth. And so deception really means that we're not practicing the path properly, that we are hiding behind things, and the truth cannot really be found. And if we don't find the truth, if we are walking in darkness, if we are deluding ourselves, how are we possibly going to make good decisions in our life? Good decisions rely on the idea of being truthful and being honest, and then moving forward as it actually is so um, be, be very careful with the ego. Yeah, the ego, to my mind, is a very often kind of a terrible thing. The ego is very, I don't know, I find it very, um, very disconcerting sometimes to see the ego and how stupid it is and how, how much decrement it has in our lives. And so watch that in yourself. Yeah, see how how you know how it destroys so many of the good qualities within you sometimes someone may um, you know say something bad to you or your ego may feel hurt or whatever way and the moment your ego is hurt very often we become cold we become hard we reject other people all of these things really come out of the ego the ego is really quite a terrible thing in that particular sense so by being able to let go a little bit of the ego, we are letting go of so many of these mechanisms that actually destroy some of the beautiful qualities that otherwise we actually may have. Don't be too hard on yourself. Don't think that you can let go of the ego straight away. You can't. And if you cannot and the ego kind of rears its ugly head or whatever, that is okay. But just be aware of it and see the damage it does. And as you do that, you will be able to let go of it a little bit more. And then the spiritual path starts to become more powerful as a consequence. So much of Buddhism is about having this clear-eyed idea of reality, understanding who we are, understanding our issues, and then gradually, gradually, gradually moving in the right direction here. So that is the idea of not being devious, yeah, not being a trickster, but having a degree of integrity, showing ourselves who we actually are, being honest with ourselves. Asatta amayavi, the third factor of these factors of uh, uh, making a right effort. Yeah, if you are, um, if you are going to, if you're not, not being honest, uh, then why would you put forth the right effort? Because the effort is precisely about discovering truth. Uh, now, the first, fourth factor on this path uh, is the factor of, uh, it's called virya, uh, virya aradha, virya aramba, depending on context, I think. And this is the idea of uh, starting energy or putting, putting uh, forth energy in your life. And uh, you will find very often that uh, if you're feeling a bit lazy or you don't really want to do anything yeah sometimes what you do is just you have to just give yourself a kick in the butt yeah and i'm, sure, I'm not sure that's possible to give oneself a kick in the butt but you know what i mean and when you do that uh, yeah just get going uh, just by starting just by getting established uh, yeah the energy starts to come up yeah okay i'm just getting up uh, and i'm just uh, going to do a bit of meditation or a bit of walking around a little bit or to reflect a little bit on the sutta, whatever it is that you do, just by getting things going, very often we kind of overcome the inertia of the mind and then we can actually uh, get the uh, energy and get do the right uh, effort uh, that is required for this path. So sometimes you just have to establish that energy and get going. That's the fourth one of these uh, uh, factors. Uh, and then we have the last one of these five factors, and the last one is wisdom. So please be wise. Yeah, are you going to be wise? Can you promise to be wise? It is hard 
to be wise, right? It is really difficult to be wise sometimes. And sometimes we don't even know exactly the meaning of wisdom. In general, you can say that a wise person is someone who is kind, someone who is gentle, someone who lives well. That is a kind of wisdom. But in this context, the wisdom is more like the wisdom of insight into the Buddha's teachings. Yeah, understanding the, especially the arising or passing away of things is how it is uh, um, how it is phrased in this particular context. Uh, because when you understand the arising and passing away of things, uh, you understand that there's nothing at all to hold on to in the whole world, uh, nothing to grasp. Yeah, sambe dhamma nalang abhinavesaya. Sambe dhamma nalang abhinavesaya. This is one of those very famous statements by the Buddha. There is nothing in the world worth holding on to. And if you travel around in India, and if you look at many of the inscriptions, uh, uh, lots of Buddhist inscriptions in India, this is one of those very famous inscriptions that you find in many, many places. Sambhe Dhamma Nalang Abhinavesaya. There's nothing in the world worth holding on to. Yeah, so remember that. This is kind of the idea of the higher wisdom. Uh, and remembering that, understanding that there's nothing in the world worth holding on to, it means that your mind inclines very powerfully to the spiritual path. It means that undertaking the effort, uh, doing the right thing, becomes just a matter of course, uh, because you understand that that is where the real relief from that unsatisfactory world, from that problematic world, that is, where it is, that is where it is to be found. You understand this in a deeper way, the uncertainty, the unreliability of everything around us. And that is what this kind of wisdom really is about. So um, uh, then, uh, based on that, uh, it then becomes possible to practice metta. Yeah, this is one of the factors that block you for meta practice together with all the other factors of uh, not living well and then you start to be able to see the world in a different way to start to see the people in a different way and um, we are now in the rainy season here in Perth and yesterday I was just walking around my little kuti, kuti is a little hut in the forest and I was just watching and I was seeing how green everything is Usually here in Perth, everything is really brown and gray, but during the winter, during the rainy season, everything is green and beautiful. Just like England is, is all year round, we only have a few months of that here in Australia. And uh, so I was walking around and I was kind of enjoying the birds and enjoying the kangaroos and enjoying the view of the ocean in the distance. Uh, my cutie is kind of on a hill, so I can see the ocean in the distance, yeah, the Indian Ocean looking towards Sri Lanka and India and that way. And it was very beautiful seeing the sunset, sun going down over the ocean. It was very beautiful. And I realized as I was looking at that, I realized that the reason why I can enjoy this is because of the goodness I have lived in the past. The reason I am a human being is because I have lived well in the past. This is the result of the kamma that I have done in the past. So whenever you look at the nature around you, there's lots of beautiful nature in England, yeah, in all over Europe, beautiful nature, beautiful little villages, so many beautiful things. When you walk around and you see these things, remember what you are seeing as a reflection of the goodness in human hearts. You're seeing an expression of metta right there in the world around you. That is what it really is, because all of these things we can only enjoy because we are doing good karma. That is why we enjoy these things. But you can take it one step further. And one of the things that I like to do is sometimes just look up in the starry sky. The starry sky is very spectacular here in Australia because we have the Milky Way in a much uh, much more obvious than it is in Northern Europe. You have the whole Milky Way in a very lots and lots and lots of stars there. And sometimes you look at the Milky Way and you think, think that the Milky Way or the universe is very cold and very violent and very dark and full of aliens and full of asteroids that might crash into the earth or whatever. Sometimes we think about the world like that. But that is not the Buddhist way to think about the universe. 
The Buddhist way to think about the universe uh, is to remember that the, according to the Buddhist teachings, uh, these higher spiritual beings called the devas, called the brahmas, uh, these are the beings that permeate that cosmos. Uh, they live in this cosmos. They are part of this cosmos, being the lords of the galaxy, being the lords of the clusters of galaxies made by the universe as a whole. Uh, the world is permeated uh, by the qualities of these high divine beings who are full of loving kindness, metta, compassion, karuna, all of these beautiful qualities. This is what actually is up there. So next time you look up into the sky, you look up into the night sky, you see the moon, you see all of these things, look for the metta, look for the kindness. The world is not cold or violent or terrible. The world, the universe, as we see it, actually is instead filled with metta, compassion, and all of these beautiful qualities. And when you look at the universe like that, then you are closer to the Buddhist idea of what the universe is like. Then you can use that too as an aid to develop the idea of metta. Instead of being afraid of the world, instead of being afraid of the universe, see it as something friendly and something beautiful in this way. And then you are have another little tool in your toolbox to develop these beautiful qualities of mind. So uh, that is a little talk for you today on the idea of not being uh, deceptive and also a little bit about metta and kindness and all of these kind of things. And uh, that is all I wish to say for now. So uh, you are now very welcome to uh, ask some questions or make comments or whatever you like. So uh, go for it. Let's, we'll see what happens. Karin, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Ajahn, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very timely talk for me. Um, I can relate to, to what you're saying on a number of levels. I would like to give you an example of what is blocking me in my meta and how I think a deception okay. has contributed to this. Um, <clears throat> last year, I decided to euthanize my, my dog, um, who was my uh, companion for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... What I might have happened, and this was before I found the Dharma. Now I look at it differently. But I think I uh, I feel a very strong blockage because of that decision. Because yeah. I think I deceived myself by thinking I was relieving her suffering when I was actually, I think, relieving my suffering. Okay. Um. So, and... I'm aware of the huge amount of karma I might have uh, caused with this. So there, there are moments of clarity where I can talk myself through this, but I actually feel a visceral blockage where I, when I have moments of spiritual weakness, I almost feel, well, there's no point to any of this because of the gravity of what I've done. Mm. <clears throat> then sometimes I think, okay, Karen, um, look at it as, then I'm thinking if I had found the Dharma then, wouldn't have it been a, a deception of my, on my part? Wouldn't I have deceived myself if I had said, don't euthanize because um, this would be a selfish act? But then I would think, well, yeah, but then, the animal is suffering. I, I I'm, I'm caught up in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, co I'm totally caught up, and there is. I, I need. I was wondering whether you could give me some assistance in finding a way out. I know I have to do it. I have to find the way. But if you could shine a light on this, please. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. No, thank you for that question. That's a really nice question, actually. I, I, I like that one, and it's very. Uh, and I, I think what you're saying is true. That it actually is quite common you know when you are in this kind of situation it's very easy to deceive ourselves and not really understanding who is suffering that we are we wanting to extinguish 
But uh, first thing I would like to say is that uh, it can be very difficult to know, and you may very well have done the right thing. It's very difficult to know whether, you know, even though you were helping with your own suffering, you may also have been helping with the suffering of the animal at the same time. There isn't necessarily any conflict there. They may actually have been going in the right direction. So it may very well have been a positive thing that you did. Uh, and uh, very often, someone like Ajahn Brahm, he will say that what you should do in that kind of situation is ask your animal, ask your, uh, you know, your dog or whatever, and say, well, have you had enough? Would you like to die? And sometimes if you have a close connection with an animal, you can probably feel whether that dog is ready to die or not. Uh, yeah. And so that is kind of the right way, the ideal way to do it. But some people may not get a satisfactory answer that way. And when you don't get a satisfactory answer, at the end of the day, you have to make a choice anyway. Yeah? So don't think that you necessarily have done anything wrong. This is my first point. You just don't know. It's very hard to know. You did your very best at the time with limited information. You were leaning in the right direction. You were thinking about your dog. Yeah, you were. That, that is what you were doing. So you already had many of the right things in place. So. The second thing I would say is that the, the amount of bad kamba you have done, I don't think it is, is huge. Yeah, it is very common in the world. Killing animals is a very, very common thing. And it is not going to necessarily be any huge blockage for you. Don't think it is a blockage because by thinking it is a blockage, it becomes a blockage. Rather realize that, okay, so maybe it wasn't ideal, but it's not such a massive thing. You know, you have tried to a large extent to do the right thing. You were coming at least in part from the idea of compassion. At least the idea of compassion was there. So you were doing many of the right things. So maybe there was a little bit of a problem there, but it wasn't a great deal. The third thing is the fact that you are learning from this. Yeah, the idea of the Dhamma is to grow. Everyone makes little mistakes, and this, make no mistake, this is a little mistake. It is not a big mistake. If you had murdered someone in your family, okay, that would have been a really bad mistake. But you haven't murdered any human being, yeah? It is more like uh, a, a helping an animal a little bit. Uh, and so you have maybe made a small mistake, yeah? But learn from that. The fact that you are learning means that you are on the right track. You are on the track for growth. You're on the track for changing the way you're thinking about the world. You're on the track for living in a good way. So now your job is to learn to forgive yourself for that, letting go of that. And the way to do that is to understand that you yourself were deluded. You yourself didn't understand what was going on. You are asking too much of yourself. You're asking that you should be enlightened and have understanding when that actually very often is impossible. It is impossible because we are all in a little bit of darkness. We've all been born into this world because we weren't enlightened in the first place. So forgive yourself. Understand your own limitations. You are only human like everyone else. Of course you're going to make mistakes. It is okay to make mistakes, especially when you learn from it in this way. And then you can move on. And then you can actually grow in the Dhamma as a consequence. So this is I, what I would say is the right approach. And this is also the approach that is used by the Buddha in the suttas. When someone comes to the Buddha in the suttas and they say, I made a mistake, this is exactly what the Buddha says. He says, this is growth in the Dhamma, that you understand your mistake and now that you're moving on. And so this is already a very good starting point. So uh, try some of those ideas and see if you can make yourself move forward based on that. Thank you. There are a couple of questions in the chat, Dajan. Yeah. Would you like to read them out, uh, Manori? Yeah. Um, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful talk, Ajahn Brahmali. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. If you don't mind telling us the name of the sutta or sutta number regarding the five factors of effort. Thank you very much, Ajahn. Okay, I think it is it is in the Anguttara Nikaya 5, isn't it? because that's where you find these uh, suttas in the Anguttara 5. I think it is uh, um, Anguttara fives. Uh, okay, hold on one second. I'll I'll get it for you. I think I, I think I probably have it here actually. Let's see if I can find the exact suit for you. 
it is um, it's a very short sutta, as you might expect. Uh, it only has these five factors. Uh, and uh, then, uh, ah, it's actually called the Padani, Pad Padani Anga Sutta. Padani Anga Sutta. And it is found in the Anguttara 5, it's number 53. That is the sutta. So the 53rd sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya 5 is Padani Angani Sutta. So there you are. And there are a couple of more questions, Ajahn. Uh, hmm. Is it good to chant the Saleka Sutta every other day as a practice, Ajahn? Is it good to chant the Saleka Sutta every other day as a practice? <laughs> um, the Saleka Sutta, this is the Majjhima Nikaya, the eighth Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya. And Saleka is often translated as effacement. Yeah, effacement in the sense that you are... It's almost like you are rubbing yourself out. You are, you know, you are rubbing out your ego and your sense of self. This is the idea of effacement. You are effacing something, taking off the face, taking off the surface of things. Uh, uh, and uh, that is kind of the idea of non-self in a way. Is it good to chant that sutta? Um, yeah, it's always nice. It, I think what matters is that you find a sutta that inspires you and that you understand. Uh, and if you understand the sutta and it and the content is inspiring for you and it makes you practice better, then it is good. Then it is a positive thing. Yeah. So uh, if you are going to chant the Saleka Sutta, either you should understand the Pali or you should chant an English version of the sutta. Then it comes alive. Yeah. And when it comes alive in this way, then it becomes far more powerful. Yeah? That's what I would uh, uh, recommend. And uh, you may find that instead of chanting the Saleka Sutta, which I think is a little bit dry and it's very repetitive, I might recommend chanting something like the Metta Sutta or maybe the Ratana Sutta instead, because it is a bit more, um, it has a bit more kind of, uh, more about the good qualities in life, the Metta and all the positive qualities. Yeah. There's another question, Ajahn. Uh, dear Ajahn, could you... Say more about how to prevent the ego from getting the best of you. When you are being faced with some terrible injustice and are being humiliated in public, this is in the context of a workplace situation. Yeah. Um, yes. So, uh, that, that, you know, and sometimes, sometimes we should also not set the bar too high. Very often, sometimes when you set the bar too high, it becomes impossible to clear and you can't really you can't really do it and so if you are really getting humiliated in a bad way i think it is natural for most of us that the ego will resist that and the ego will object to being treated badly like that and so uh, in that kind of situation don't don't try you know to too hard to kind of resist because sometimes it is just impossible but the general way of overcome the ego is to practice the Noble Eightfold Path, because the Noble Eightfold Path will uh, will stop you naturally from allow the ego will not be allowed to come forth, because by being kind, by thinking in the right way, it means the ego will not be able to express those negative qualities, uh, because you are restraining that. Uh, more generally, the idea of metta in life, the idea of compassion for other people will allow, will subdue the ego. The ego doesn't really exist when the metta is very, very powerful because you will feel good about yourself. You feel good about all other people. And if someone else treats you badly or humiliates you in public, you will have compassion for them because you know that you are a good person. You know because you have metta. And so it is the other person you feel sorry for because you know they're being stupid. Yeah, they are treating badly a good person. And that is very, very stupid. And so you practice that metta. And eventually, as you do that, the whole idea of ego subsides. But also notice, as I mentioned before, the, uh, uh, the danger of the ego Yeah, and how how hard it is and how ugly it can be and how it destroys the good qualities inside of you. And when you see the ugliness of the ego, it becomes easy to give it up as a consequence. So uh, just practice the path, practice kindness, practice metta. And as you do that, the ego will gradually diminish.
Okay, Manor, is there anything else then? Uh, there are no chats um, yet, Ajahn. Okay, yeah. Would anyone like to say anything here? Melanie has raised a hand, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ajahn. That was very timely because um, I was going to ask a question about sense, uh, sense restraint. Mm -hmm. And um, because what I thought was uh, we're supposed to let go of uh, worldly pleasure or sensation. So in my opinion, going for a walk in nature or enjoying the beautiful landscape or uh, uh, good food uh, was not to be um, developed. But, uh, but at the same time, it's, I find it hard um, to find pleasure just in the, the meditation. And um, so it's, I've, it's difficult to, to find a balance between the worldly hobbies i would say and the the, the benefit of the meditation mm. so i i enjoyed very much when you said when when i see when i go for a walk just to to sit with meta and to to think about uh, all the good karma we must have done to be reborn as a human mm. so i was also wondering how how can I um, keep practicing meditation and find happiness and joy and, and at the same time for it not to be too dry? I'm yeah. not sure you understand my question. Okay. I, no, I understand very well. I, 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 because this is, a, this is a very common problem in Buddhism. Uh, people become a little bit too idealistic and they want to reject the world and they just want to live the spiritual path and that is not really what sense restraint is about yeah there are different ways of enjoying life and one of the uh, you know some of the some of the enjoyments are very simple like the enjoyment of nature for example is very often quite peaceful you know when i walk around my kuti i look at the grass i look at the trees I see the birds, sometimes I see the eagle. We have some beautiful eagles soaring in the sky here. The kangaroos grazing and the lizard coming around. Uh, actually, it's very peaceful. There's something about nature that doesn't really you know, stir up the mind very much, but actually dry, leads the mind towards peace instead. Uh, and so instead of, you know, kind of avoiding all the pleasures in life, uh, ask yourself what is uh, uh, what leads in the right direction, what leads away. Uh, when it comes to food, enjoy your food, enjoy your meals. Uh, one of the things I really liked about Ajahn Brahm when I came to this monastery, Ajahn Brahm always say, enjoy your meals. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is to the monks, enjoy your meals, he said to us. Uh, yeah, don't kind of be too, uh, too ascetic or whatever. And the reason is because if you enjoy that one meal you have or the two meals that you have or the three meals or whatever it is that you have, then you don't think about the food so much afterwards. You had your, you know, you had your meal, and then you let go of the food afterwards. So the lack of restraint is if you think about food during your meditation. That is the lack of restraint. That is when it is problematic. If you sit down thinking about dinner or whatever, then it is problematic. But enjoy your food, enjoy your meals. Uh, don't enjoy them in a kind of restless, agitated way where you eat very fast and you kind of be, are stupid or whatever, but enjoy it in a peaceful kind of way, just tasting the food or whatever. Uh, and so we need to find this balance between the uh, sensory world uh, and the meditation world. Uh, enjoy the sensory world, but start to look at those sensual experiences that are disturbing, that are too much driven by craving and desires, that lead to restlessness, that lead to agitation. Those are the ones you want to kind of withdraw a little bit from. Look at the dangerous kind of desires in the world. There are some desires that are very problematic and cause all kinds of problems. Look at those, like the desire to go to the casino. Yeah, Don't go to the casino. That's usually a bad idea. And so you, you learn uh, to kind of navigate in this way. Uh, 
But to make sure that you enjoy life, it is very, very important to enjoy life. If you don't enjoy life at all, neither the spiritual practice nor the ordinary life, then uh, life, as you say, becomes very dry and very boring. Yeah? And then when, then when you enjoy the basic things in ordinary life, it's also easier to enjoy the meditation practice because it means you have a degree of kindness towards yourself. Uh, yeah, you know that you need happiness, you know that you need enjoyment, and that is a kind of happiness, a kind of uh, metta towards yourself, uh, a kind of compassion for yourself. Uh, and so you find when you have more compassion for yourself, when you have kindness towards yourself, uh, it is easier also to uh, have success in the spiritual practice, uh, because that kindness is part of the foundation of the spiritual practice. Uh, so don't find, so this is, uh, you know, so find, try to find that balance if you can, uh, Melanie, and then you, I think you will have more success both in uh, uh, your worldly uh, part of your life and also the spiritual part of your life. Uh. Thank you. I'm going to unmute uh, Art. Yes. Uh, hello. Yeah, I have... Um... A more general question: Would that be uh, okay, or or we, are we yeah, limited? Please, to talk about please. Um, I, I come from a a background where there's a lot of emphasis on uh, consciousness, so I'm I'm sensitive to the teachings around consciousness, mm -hmm. and um, I was just wondering: Is there any consciousness presence at Nirvana, and and if not, how how do we even know about Nirvana? Well, in Nirvana, in Buddhism, is about uh, is really about what happens when you become enlightened. When you become enlightened, that is the attainment of Nirvana. So, Nirvana, what it means in traditional Buddhism, is just the ending of the defilements of the mind. Yeah. So, when your anger is gone and your desires are gone and your delusion is gone, that is the meaning of Nirvana. Nirvana means the extinguishment of the flame. And what gets extinguished when you become an arahant, when you reach the awakening, uh, is those particular defilements. They are extinguished. Uh, and that is nirvana. So it's the ending of uh, the three root defilements. It's also the ending of suffering. Uh, and the suffering is also a kind of a fire. Yeah, it burns you. It's painful. That also comes to an end. Uh, and this is really the, the main meaning of nirvana in the suttas. And of course, the arahant is conscious. Yeah, you can see arahants in the world. And so they are obviously conscious. They're still around. And that is, uh, that is the nirvana which really matters. And that is the one that uh, uh, I think is most fruitful to talk about, the ending of suffering in that way. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's very clear. There is one last question in the chat, Tajan. I will read it. Yeah. Uh, thank, okay. you, thank you, Ajahn, for a great talk. Question. If anger arises during a situation, is it best to be mindful and look inwardly at the mind state, mind state to avoid reacting negatively? So not to pay attention to blaming the other or situation. Is it best to practice this way, Sadhu? Uh, that is that is a good start. Uh, the good start is to be mindful, uh, uh, but you need to do more than mindfulness. Uh, one of the uh, suttas in the Sangyutta Nikaya, uh, um, Mano Baddha Sutta, something like that, uh, the Buddha says to overcome anger, you have to practice metta. Mindfulness is not enough, says the Buddha. And so you are mindful, but then you also, at the same time, you also... Uh, try to look at the situation in a different way. Yeah? So you are mindful, and then you ask yourself, why am I getting angry? And then you can turn your mind towards compassion, or you can turn your mind towards metta, because you know that it's, it's anger is not very useful. You know that the other person is being stupid. You know that the other person doesn't really understand anyway. But it's nothing to do with you. It just has to do with the defilements in the other person. And as you do that, you can turn your mind towards compassion instead of getting angry with that person. There. So that is the brief answer. It's a long, long thing to talk about overcoming anger because it's actually a very involved subject and it's a very important subject. But that at least gives you some basic ideas of how to uh, uh, deal with it. Uh, so... That's it. So, Manori, do you want to finish things off? Yes. Um, thank you very much, Ajahn Brahmali, for the wonderful, rich teachings. 
and uh, for giving us an opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, uh, and today's teaching, as all of you know, was offered on a donation basis freely uh, in the spirit of generosity. And with your generosity, Anukampa Bikuni project, including Venerable Chanda, can provide the community and the wide world with valuable Dhamma talks, teachings, and meditation retreats. All these talks, as you know, we record them and then we put in the YouTube uh, for years to come for many people to access, not only the people who come here, but um, all the other people uh, uh, who access our YouTube channel as well. Um, and as you know, um, Anukampa Bikuni Project is a UK charity uh, and um, uh, and uh, Anukampa Grove Monastery in Oxford gives more space for the monastics, uh, opportunity for women to ordain and lay people to visit, etc. So your donations are very valuable in maintaining the monastery as well and keeping the upkeep of the maintenance cost and costs to um, change this house into a workable monastery, which we are still doing. Um, so I invite you to support Anukampa if you are able. Uh, what we need these days is mostly the financial support. So if you would like to support the monastery and the Sangha's requisites, um, you are invited to donate uh, using the link that uh, Matthias put earlier. Um, and we, if you are able, standing orders are particularly helpful. And uh, no donation is small, so don't think that you can't donate a big amount. Um, even a small donation is a big amount because collectively we can um, do it. Um, and thank you very much. And um, uh, I'd also like to highlight that uh, Sunday program, most of it is starting uh, um, in the evening and there are a couple of it like when Ajahn Ramali or when Rabalupeka comes, it is at uh, nine o'clock. So please be careful with the timings. Thank you very much. And okay. thank you very okay. much, Ajahn, again. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. See you next time. <laughs> okay.